Good day, race fans! I'm Unsilent, and we're on the air with more Grand Prix 2! Formula 1 2017 is coming out in less than a month, but we're kicking it old school by going back to 1996's game that looks at the 1994 Formula 1 World Championship, and this time it's round number 9, the German Grand Prix, as we've crossed the halfway mark of our sim of the 1994 F1 World Championship, the German Grand Prix from the Hockenheim Ring in Germany, yeah, it is the Hockenheim Ring. If you're a newer F1 fan, it was in the uh, early 2000s that they switched to track design. We will take a look at a comparison of the two track maps. But this is a very different German Grand Prix layout at the Hockenheim Ring. From the Egypt Curve, which is the start of the stadium section, through the Nord Curve, which is the first turn of the lap, it's the same. But rather than turning off less than halfway out to the first chicane, no, it goes out to the forest, to the Clark chicane, to the... Ost Curve, and then to the Senna Curve before leading you back into the stadium section. Power's at a premium, slipstreaming's at a premium, and bravery under the brakes. Those are the keys to success in the classic Hockenheim Ring. And here is a look at the track map. Then is in the gray, and now is the black track map. As you can see, you don't even get halfway out to the Clark Chicane before you're turning off onto the new part to there. They've, uh, unfortunately, the tilkization, yeah, the Hermit tilkization, I think that's a good way of putting it, of this track, unfortunately, got rid of three great overtaking opportunities on this track from uh, the Clark Ost, not so much the Santa Chicane, but the Egypt Curve back into the stadium section. Great overtaking opportunities taken away by the tilkization of F1, but it was done in the name of safety. Unfortunately, it kind of made the racing there a little bit dull. And because of so many changes in the track, we aren't going to do the track uh, track lap. We are doing this track map there, though. It's a shame. I really like the old Hockenheim ring. It had some character to it. It was a lot like Monza, except with a few more overtaking opportunities because you had a few more chicanes in here. It is one of the great losses of Formula One, not having... Not having this old high-speed track that really... Oh, boy, was there a lot of attrition in this 94 race. But we'll see that in the uh, Let's Play. Let's take a look at the driver standings through eight rounds at the halfway point. David Coulthard on five wins leads Michael Schumacher on one win and Jean Lacy on two wins. Then it's Hill in fourth. I'm in fifth as Eddie Irvine, Gerhard Berger, Ukio Kariyama, Rubens Barrichello, Mika Hakkinen, and Jos Verstappen round out the points. After eight rounds, we have 10 point scores in the 2017 season. We had that many point scores after just one race. Back then, it was the top six scored points. Ten to one was how it was done. But uh, you can see uh, the David Coulthard well out front taking up Michael Schumacher's role in championship as it was in real life. I think DC, my working theory is DC still has the Ayrton Senna AI. And Senna started the season in number two. Williams died at the uh, San Marino Grand Prix at Imola quite tragically and was replaced by David Coulthard after that. On to the World Constructors' Championship. Williams holds a substantial lead. Once again, six or five wins, rather, for Williams. Two for Ferrari, one for Benetton. The difference between Ferrari and Benetton is that 38 of those points have come from Michael Schumacher, whereas Ferrari is getting a nice split. 35 points from Alessi and 12 points from Gerhard Berger. So they're sharing the load, and that's what's gotten them into P2 in the World Constructors' Championship. Then it's Jordan. I think we've managed to successfully hold down fourth. Then you've got Tyrrell and McLaren rounding out the Constructors' Championship point scores at the halfway point. Before we get to qualifying, this was a critical race for two reasons. The first, this rule changed the addition of the 10 millimeter legality plank to the underside of the floor. That is a wooden plank underneath the floor of the car designed to increase the ride height and reduce the aerodynamic downforce from the ground effect of the floor. Now you're granted a maximum wear of one millimeter over a race distance, and if you wear in excess of that one millimeter, you're disqualified. The 94 Belgian Grand Prix saw Michael Schumacher disqualified for excessive wear. They claimed that he spun over a curb and it ground down the rear of the um, legality plank. That ruling uh, went against them with the FIA. Also famous for this instance, incident on the dash, Nios Verstappen pitting in the Benetton and a problem with the refueling caused 
upwards of three liters of fuel to spill out and then ignite it on the car's exhaust, causing a massive plume of fire and smoke in the pit lane. The injuries were thankfully very minor. Yoss had a couple of burns because you saw his visor was up a little bit. They were able to get the fire out in, under control fairly quickly. Another look, the rear jackman on that car was actually NBC SN analyst Steve Matchett, who writes about it in his book, Life in the Fast Lane. Completing our first run in Friday qualifying. I told you we get to qualifying with a 49-620. Not bad when you look at it, it's P2. But then by the time I get back around to the pits, oh, it's P8 and I'm over two seconds off the pace set by Michael Schumacher. So we go out for another qualifying run. Fortunately, that Minardi gets out of the way as I'm on my hot lap. I dropped a P12 by this point, charging to the line, and it's a one and a half second improvement down to a 48. One, two, three, and that's good enough to get me to provisional P4 in this qualifying session. And uh, spoilers, I wasn't able to get out in time for a final qualifying run, even though I had laps left. But if you take a look at the qualifying results from Friday qualifying DC, Provisional pole, Schumacher in second, half a second back. Damon Hill, nine-tenths back. The top three are the only ones within a second of fastest on Friday. And then you take a look back. I'm fourth, Berger fifth, Hackenden sixth. And Hackenden is the only driver within two seconds. So the top six are the only ones within two seconds. Then you go back to Panis, Alessi, Barrichello, Katayama. Now, Olivier Panis, the Ligiers haven't been too good if you've been watching the other videos, but the Ligiers had that Renault engine, the same Renault engine that's powering Coulthard's Williams, and that gave them a massive boost in this race because they had the best engine on the grid, bar maybe the Ferrari V12, but the Ligier may not have been great on downforce, but had all the speed, and what a power track like Hockenheim does is it tosses up the grid like you see Katayama in 10th usually you see him around 7 8th but the Yamaha just didn't have the power more Bedelli in 11th Eric Bernard in the 2nd Ligier up in 12th Martin Brundle in the McLaren Peugeot usually see him back around 16th he's 13th here and so a power track like this certainly mixes up the results in qualifying and actually we're probably going to see that mirrored in maybe Spa, but definitely Monza when we get there for the Italian Grand Prix. Saturday qualifying, here's my first qualifying run, or a uh, second lap on my first run, and I go to a 47.949, and I've broken the 48 barrier, and it says I'm in P2, but uh, spoilers, I didn't actually improve my position on the grid with that run, so... The Friday time from Hill still stood up ahead of me, so I went out for another run, tweaked a whole bunch of stuff, dropped the downforce, and I found 1.1 seconds through the first split. And then here we are to Oost, the Oost curve, and oh, I've bottled it. And the problem is I've lost time through the turn, and I've lost time accelerating out of the turn. The Senna chicane's the fastest of the three, so that mistake compounds through the lap. And then by the time we get to the line here, from 1.1 to 0.2 seconds. So it's another improvement, but sadly, that also won't improve my grid position. But my grid position is P4, as you can see, as we look at the grid for the 1994 German Grand Prix on Grand Prix 2. David Coulthard's on the pole, as expected, alongside Michael Schumacher, who broke into within a half second of Coulthard. Damon Hill on the inside of row number two. And then I'm on the outside, just, just, just within one second of DC. I'm basically the best of the rest at this point. If I could put together some results, I might do myself pretty good and get back into a fight for second place in the championship, but I'm not going to do it if I'm going to be stuck behind cars with more powerful engines behind me, so start's going to be critical. Mika Hakkinen in the McLaren Peugeot and Gerhard Berger alongside in the Ferrari. Jean Alesi on the inside of row four and on the outside of him is Olivier Panis in the Ligier Renault. We already talked about had the advantage of the Renault engine in that Ligier. Panis actually finished on the podium. It was a double podium for Ligier in this race in real life. Can they repeat it without a first corner calamity taking out like 11 cars? Row number five, it's Rubens Barrichello and the Jordan Hart. Not too bad a result for him. And then it's Ukio Katayama on the outside of row five in the Tyrol Yamaha. 
Johnny Morbidelli, car number 10 in P11, not P10 as we're used to seeing him. Pierre Luigi Martini in the Minardi Ford. He is on the outside of row six in position number 12. On back to row number seven, where you have Eric Bernard. Eric finished third in this race in real life, but he's got to try and make his way to the podium from P number 13. Again, little first lap collision. He's going to be in a little bit of trouble getting there. Niels Verstappen, the last car on the first page of the results. He was P14. We're used to seeing him a little farther back. Speaking of a little farther back, we're used to seeing Martin Brunel a little farther back in the qualifying results, but 15th, not too bad. Johnny Herbert, P16, well back from where we're used to seeing Johnny in qualifying. Mercedes, the 2017, is the dominant engine. 1994, not so much. Andrea de Cesar is the fastest Mercedes for Sauber in P17. Eric Coman, the LaRousse Ford in P18. Mark Blundell, P19, with the Tyrrell Yamaha. And Michele Alberetto, eight spots back of his teammate in P20. Heinz Harold Frensen in the second Sauber Mercedes at P21. Christian Fittipaldi, you're used to seeing these three guys in this sequence. Christian Fittipaldi on the outside of row 11, followed by Alex Zanardi in the Lotus Mugen Honda on the inside of row 12, and Olivier Beretta in the LaRousse Ford on the outside of row 12. Two future IndyCar stars and a future sports car star. On row 13, the last qualifiers on the grid, David Brabham in the Simtech Ford. And alongside him, John Paul Belmondo, shotgun on the field in position 26. The warning horn goes, the engines come to life, it's race time in Grand Prix 2 for Red Lights. The revs come up, they bring the noise, and green, green, green! And I just get sandwiched off the start, it's a Jordan sandwich. And I bump Schumacher through turn one, I'm just gonna take the position and run. As I got taken on both sides by the Ferrari of Berger, and the Ligier of Panis, and there goes Panis looking up the inside of Berger, into Clark! Side by side, and under braking, just a positioning goes in the favor of Panis as he takes position number three. Let's take a look at the replay, focusing on me. And Schumacher checks up a lot through the Nord curve and I don't have any place to go but on the inside of him. Let's take a look at this as ducking down to the outside into the Nord curve goes uh, Panis. And I think he might have forced Schumacher to check up a little bit on board with Panis. Finding the gap Actually, Schumacher probably got squeezed on both sides. Panis on one side, Berger on the other. Worse. Oh, there's the uh, replay, sorry, of me, Berger. Schumacher's day gets worse as he gets overtaken by a Lacey into the Oost curve. And then going down to the Clark curve on the same lap. Here comes a Lacey down my inside. Well, you break from sixth to third gear. It's not much of an overtaking opportunity. So Lacey had to back out, his discretion was the better part of Valor. Coming up to the end of lap two, looking to get a good run out of the suit curve. On Berger, looking down towards the nerd Nord curve, not enough. There's again, not a lot of breaking into the Nord curve. So I'm going to slipstream him down to the Clark. Nice slipstream, get by him, watch the speedo, 210, 211, 212 as I hit the brakes a little early because I've, that's about 10 miles per hour faster I've gone and uh, being a little, uh, being a little chicken shit on the brakes lets Berger right back by me into Clark after making that lovely pass on the straight. He was able to have enough bravery under the brakes to get by me into Clark. Unfortunately, that mistake would put me into the clutches of Lacey looking around the outside to the Oost curve. Side by side. And I go the last of the late breakers. I go the last of the late breakers there, but I didn't go that into Clark. Now here comes the Lacey. We're coming out of Senna towards Egypt into the stadium section. Side by side through the right-hander there. On board with Schumacher, who's got the best seat in the house for this. Side by side through Egypt and into Saks. A lazy head. I pull ahead and I've got the right line through the chicane. Once again, here's the replay. Side by side through Saks. Seeing this is what... 
a fantastic race we're having. Sp meanwhile, Berger gets by Panis and into position number three and on the podium. Later on, Schumacher goes out of the race. What happened to Schumacher? He has to pull off. He's had a mechanical failure. When I look on board, it says that he had a transmission failure and the rear wheel seizing up like that says, yeah, it definitely was the transmission going on the Benetton. He actually retired because of an engine failure in real life. Lap seven, I managed to blow it at the Oost curve. Alacy's gonna get me. No, he's not. He's disappearing in the rear few mirrors. What happened to Alacy? That, that uh, trail of smoke kind of gives it away. The Ferrari V12. Let's go on him. And all of a sudden, poor Lacey looking for fourth and ends up out of the race. Couple laps after that, picking up the pieces from my mistake and I'm able to get by Olivier Panis. Looking to get by him for position number four and I managed to get by him late in the straight into the Clark Curve. With three laps to go, I'm hoping that I can hold on to that one. A little later on in this... No, we're going to st stay with me. As here comes the Ligier in the slipstream. Last of the late breakers. Well, well uh, he was basically stopped on the apex. That little bump is perfectly fine. As we take a look at the replay. He's out, breaks me, but he has to come to a stop to make the turn. I have to give him a little chrome horn to get him out of the way there. Later on that same lap, it's still happening, and then... Oh no! Oh no! The left rear tire has come loose on the straight. And now I've lost all sorts of stability in the car. I have to get really slow through the center chicane. It's okay in a straight line, but once I get to the edge of curve, I just have to completely scrub off all my speed to make it around the turn. As you can see there, all of a sudden on the straight, the wheel starts wobbling and better view from the onboard. That was a big problem, so I have to really back it down through the Clark chicane. Now they would have been able to hold off Panis on a tricycle yet again after a puncture. I believe it was on the, what, left front puncture at the uh, British Grand Prix in the last race. Here I am trying to let Barrichello through, and he wasn't picking up the hint. Now I have to pit and get that wheel tightened up, but it's going to be four fresh tires as I pit from P6. Before I even get to the pit box, I'm already down in P10. As I come to the service of my Jordan pit crew, four tires, no fuel, and a lovely wipe off of my visor in 7.9 seconds. But the question is, where do I cycle back out? Points are out of the question. But we'll see what we can salvage out of it. As the on-screen, on-board computer comes back up, P17. I started that sequence in fourth, and I fell 13 spots because of that loose wheel. But we get by Coma and the LaRousse there, into Egypt. And then we're coming in on Michele Alboreto out of the Nord Curve. I must have had more downforce than everyone because I was just making up so much time through the Nord Curve. As I move up into P15, and then through the Oost Curve, fresh tires and slipstream gets me by Martin Brundle for position number 14, as we come through the Sud Curve. Well, the only thing left is uh, to finish the race, but we do pick up the fastest lap of the race. Fresh tires and low fuel made it an Erstatz qualifying run. So I was able to pick up fastest lap of the race. It's no points anymore in F1, but it was minor compensation for another race foiled by bad luck. And there's the race results. One quarter distance German Grand Prix won by David Coulthard six seconds ahead of Damon Hill in the other Williams. For Williams won two in maximum constructors championship points. Gerhard Berger won the race in real life was third in Grand Prix 2. Olivier Panis couldn't make the podium but P4 is the best result of the year for Liche. Actually three points for Panis and one point for Eric Bernard, who made his way up to P6 in the other Ligier Renault. Four points that moves him ahead of the McLaren Peugeot team in the World Constructors Championship. Sandwiched between the Ligiers is Rubens Barrichello in the second Jordan Hart. Then rounding out the top ten, you have Hakkinen, Katayama in the Tyrol of Yamaha, the footwork forward of Johnny Morbidelli, and then Jasper Stappen making his way up to P10. 
Also, probably a bit of note, good results after mm, poor qualifyings for Johnny Herbert and Andrea de Cesars in the Lotus Mugen Honda and the Sauber Mercedes, respectively. And there I am, last, on the first page. That was a lot. Well, I mean, if I was just ahead of Panis, you know, you figure that's at least 30 seconds lost because of that loose wheel. Probably more because I had the fast lap of the race. And then on back through the second page of the results, and you want to focus on those two names at the bottom, second and third in the World Drivers' Championship as Schumacher goes out first with a transmission failure, and Alacy goes out with an engine failure. And so that really hampers their World Drivers' Championship chase, as they were both counting on a big result, or at least a result from this race, and to end up not classified is a big, big dent to their World Championship chances. Not that having Coulthard with Senna AI wasn't a big enough detriment to their championship chances. Through nine rounds, Coulthard has six wins and a three race points lead over Michael Schumacher in second and John Lacey in third, who stay pat on the points they had at the start of the race. Damon Hill now makes it a three way fight for second in the World Drivers Championship. Now I've got Gerhard Berger on my tail for fifth in the World Drivers Championship. And as you go on back, Panis and Bernard make us go from 10 to 12. Drivers who've scored points with Panis getting ahead of Hakkinen for ninth in the World Drivers Championship on countback. Panis has his fourth and Hakkinen has three sixth place finishes, which gives us that result. And the World Constructors' Championship, Williams has doubled up on Ferrari with their maximum points here. I think this one is well and truly dusted. It's now up to Michael Schumacher to see if he can get Benetton ahead of Ferrari. It's that fight for a second that we're going to have to keep our eye on here. Well, it looks like my Jordan team has successfully locked down fourth place. Meanwhile, Ligier has managed to vault their way ahead of McLaren. I believe Ligier did actually finish sixth in that year's World Constructors' Championship. The next round, round 10 of the 1994 Formula 1 World Championship, brings us to the Hungaro Ring, the Hungarian Grand Prix Magyar Nagyidzs, I believe it is in Hungarian. Hasn't changed much between then and now. It's still a premium on qualifying and track position. Get some good grip on your car, a lot of downforce. Keep your car on the track. It's going to be a lot like Monaco, and I was running good in Monaco until my transmission failed. Early on in the race, I was leading that one, so I have high hopes that maybe, just maybe, if I can't end my run of bad luck and get onto the podium, maybe, just maybe, I can win this one. But we're not going to find that one out in two weeks. There's no F1 summer break in 1994, nor will we take one with this series. So we're back in two weeks for more Grand Prix 2. So until then, thank you very much for joining me. Like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you're new. Share on social media. Follow on social media. The social media handle is Unsilent On Air. The playlist is on the screen in the description down below if you want to see more Grand Prix 2. And until the next time, I'm Unsilent. Thanks very much for joining me. Like, share, subscribe, and we will see you next time.